Welcome to the Dark Side of the Rainbow. My name is Robert Wallace, and you're going to hear an interview that I did today uh, with a woman who just wrote a book that is going to help a lot of people. The book is called A Practical Response to Gender Distress, uh, Tips and Tools for Families. This is written by Pamela Garfield Yeager, um, and she has a lot of interesting insight into the war on children as we're experiencing it right now. So I encourage you to listen to this interview and visit uh, her website and gaysagainstgroomers.com for more information and resources if you happen to be dealing with this issue or you want to get involved. Enjoy the interview. All right. So we're here with Pamela Garfield Yeager. She's just... Uh, produced a new book could you show that book to us pamela yeah i have it right here gender Practical distress. response to gender distress it's kind of a mouthful but that's the name i ended up with um it's a we'll talk more about it but the reason i titled that is because there's a lot of practical things inside excellent yeah i've been through it a bit it's a it's an amazing book um there's a lot of people who've also reviewed it uh, who think it's very needed right now. So I love that for you. I love that for all of us. Thank you. You're welcome. So I'm going to launch a few questions at you and then we'll hear your insight on it. Okay. What you think? So how do you believe that the normalization of a hypersexualized culture is eroding traditional values and impacting the moral fabric of society. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know it's a mouthful. Let me simplify it. <laughs> the normalization of hypersexuality. What's wrong with it? Yeah, it's well, that, I mean, that is the uh, actually one of the people who reviewed my book, James Lindsay, is talks a lot about this. That th this is the the pinnacle of queer theory, which is basically turn everything normal and make that abnormal and make things that are abnormal normal so it's basically we are turning our world upside down I, I think it's it's creating the people that are I think this now we're you're right you started me off the out of, out of the gate conspiracy talk but the the people I think that are leading this probably not the people that are um, you know just sort of going along or you know, have been taught this, but the people that I think are pushing it from above, I think their goal is to destroy society. If we keep going in this direction, um, we are going to destroy society and we're going to destroy families. We're going to destroy just like all of the order that we have. Um, we just, our basic values and yeah, chaos. <laughs> Absolutely. What do you think um, is the responsibility of the boots on the ground, the parents, the schools, society, and um, in preserving what we have or what we had uh, from those influences? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest responsibility is, is to speak up and to not pretend or not dismiss that this is serious so to acknowledge that this is serious and to do something about it and when I say do something not I know not everyone's going to write a book and everyone's going to have an Instagram page with uh, you know viral reels or whatever um, but we can talk to our neighbors we can go to church we can say we're not going to go along with this if, if they send you they make you say pronouns at work you just don't do it and even you can even explain why like I'm not going to do this this is causing problems in society and I'm not this is not something I agree with so so I think those little things go a long way people are afraid to they don't want to make waves or they just want to get along and I think we can be respectful and we can but we can speak up because there is this sort of false consensus I think that's happening because so many people are self-silencing so if we can break that that silent majority you know to actually speak up about it and not let kids get sucked into this so easily um i think that would go a long long way yeah yeah it would we're the first line of defense between um the kids and the outside influences 
Yeah, for protecting the kids. Yeah, I mean, that's obviously your entire thing. And that's so, yeah, I think I think it's weird that there are a lot of people now that don't recognize that protecting innocence of children is important. And that that if you don't do that, that that will disrupt their psychological development. Um, one of the things I talk about in my book, actually, is the reason a lot of kids are gravitating towards being trans is because they're so ex they're exposed to porn at too young of an age or very hyper sexualized things. And it I don't know if you can call it traumatize them, but it, it impacts them to the point where they do not want to grow up to be the man or woman that they're supposed to be because they're afraid of what they saw. And then they also don't learn how to interact with each other. So the, all these things, all these ways that kids are not being protected, it, we need to protect the children. Yeah, it kind of makes me wonder about, you know, how the first thing you were saying is, you know, it really seems like a top-down operation. Seems like we have influences <laughs> that are telling organizations how to run, and then they are raising up their own leadership who's following orders. But it makes me think about the individuals themselves who are so happy-go-lucky about uh, pushing this because it's almost like they are projecting their own wild youthfulness, their own rebellious, uh, you know, heart in a sense, and in a way that will create a new world. So like when we're kids, we think, oh, you know, abolish the establishment or you know, we should be able to do whatever we want and, you know, lawlessness because, you know, freedom. And it's the um, opposite, though, really. Yeah, it, it really is because you need those boundar boundaries to experience freedom. Uh, and then you put these people in leadership and then all of a sudden they're kind of like, you know, pushing it out there like they want to see like an experiment what's going to happen in the world if everybody just does whatever they want. Yeah, what I do don't you know what they think. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just taking a minute to speculate um what do you think that the uh the current emphasis on transgender issues is doing to undermine um societal norms particularly gender roles yeah i mean it's weird um so the w path files just came out um i'm sure you're very familiar michael schellenberger kind of led that effort another a woman named mia hughes wrote it to give them credit and they got a lot of inf inside information from WPATH. That's the organization that supposedly the experts that are quoted to say, well, this they say this is the right way to, to do things. But the, what the WPATH files did was expose that they're really corrupt and they don't know what they're doing and that they're, um, you know, it's pseudoscience and it's activists and not doctors and ethical therapists. What do you think the current emphasis on the the gender issue roles is doing to undermine societal norms, particularly around uh, gender roles? Oh, right. So, yeah. So what so what Michael Schellenberger was saying when we were having this conversation, when the WPATH files came out, uh, which is these files that show the corruption of WPATH, that he couldn't understand how we went from the 70s, where we had this cartoon and this this show and record really called free to be you and me. And that was where I, you know, those are the stuff I grew up with, which was basically that boys and girls that the message was boys and girls can do what they want. It does there. You don't have to be locked into these rigid stereotypes. However, the transgender movement has kind of set us backwards where now if you are a boy that likes uh, to play with dolls or a girl that likes to play with trucks, like they, they, they just put them on puberty blockers and say that that kid is trans and basically are trying to convert them out of being just like a human being in certain ways. So it, it's taken away, I'd say, the, the the classical liberal perspective of boys and girls can have different uh, personalities, different interests, and it doesn't make them any less of a, a man or a woman. Um, but the trans movement has completely turned that upside down. Yeah, it really has. What do you think um, it could be done, should be done? Is there a, a line of permissiveness when dealing with, okay, you got a child who's going through their uh, sexual maturation, their identity is developing in terms of puberty and all this, 
and maybe they're having issues like i don't know if i'm gay or if i'm a toaster or whatever the thing is um what is like a healthy way do you think of dealing with somebody in that situation yeah i mean what i really think is children need to be grounded in truth they they need to know i think a lot of times when when a child says am i a boy or a girl and there isn't even that cartoon in Free to Be You and Me where these babies are trying to figure out if they're a boy or a girl. And the skit ends where a nurse changes a diaper and then they can see you know, under the diaper that they're a boy or a girl. And there's this big sense of relief. Oh, I'm a boy. I'm a girl. And they just want to know. And children are looking to adults to understand the world and to understand truth. And so if they're starting to think that they're a toaster or a cat or something, um, you could say, well, that's fun to pretend, but you are a little boy or a little girl. And that would, that'll actually ease their anxiety. It'll help them grow up and figure out who they are. Like that will help their identity because that is just who they are. They can't just decide to be something else. It's interesting. So you're almost saying that if a parent didn't affirm every will of the wisp, notion that came through a child's mind they might actually have a strengthened sense of who they are I think so. okay yeah it's a strengthened of who they are and then where they fit in the world right and understanding of the world if everything's changing all the time all around them between who they are and what they could be and then their peers or even their parents or other adults their teacher has new pronouns every other day that's that creates a lot of chaos and anxiety especially for a young person that doesn't understand is not grounded in truth that's hard for children and i think that's one of i mean we could get into it all day but one of the reasons why i think kids are having more anxious more anxiety yeah definitely it feels kind of like a throwback to go into this way of thinking where you know you parented the kids and the kids weren't parenting the adults yeah, yeah, it's a, that's what's happening in a lot of cases. It seems like the adults are the children. And there's this weird philosophy, let's let the child lead, um, which I, it seems like it's a big overcompensation for, you know, when in the past when children were seen, supposed to be seen, not heard, right, and at all. And I, I feel like the, the needle has moved so far now that, the children need to be heard no matter what, even when they want to be a toaster, we go along with it. And that's just, it's gone too far and it's harmful. Yeah, no, it definitely has. And uh, so that's why your book is so important right now. Mm -hmm. It's because it's actually like relevant to talk about how to practically deal with this phenomena. It's... Yeah, it's really, it just it gives very specific practical tools and also just combats a lot of the common lies that are out there that and people who aren't following this topic as closely as like we are, you know, there, I realized I, I had this clinical knowledge, understanding childhood development and just working with families. And then also, you know, being in this space of talking about this and learning about it and reading how things have been unfolding for the last few years felt like I, I was in a special position to write this book to help other people that don't watch this stuff every day. Absolutely. Yeah. When you're enmeshed in it, it's kind of like it becomes old hat to talk about, but it's still yeah. a brand new topic for most of the world who's not so concentrated on this and they're distracted and this is happening until yeah, it's happening. Think it's it's not like affecting them. So they don't really think about it that much. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of wrote this for what I say, the normies, you know, <laughs> the people that aren't like immersed in this topic every day. Yeah. It's a good introduction too, for uh, people who will have that wake up call one day, you know, they'll find, Oh, this book was written uh, three years ago by a Pamela Garfield Yeager. Now it's relevant in my life. Exactly. Because Johnny is now a dragon or whatever. Right. Or whatever the cool thing is three years from now it is. But of course, you know, they'll try to say, the trans activists will try to say all this is natural, which is, it's really hard to believe that common sense has 
been lost. Yeah, you know, we were just kind of talking about whether or not this is a top-down thing. I think we all kind of acknowledge that it is to the degree that it just didn't grow up organically around us. From your viewpoint, is this uh, do the trans issues, trans identifying issues, come out of something that is at all natural? Is it all pathological? Is it all uh, nurture? Yeah, I have a whole chapter in my book, actually, that says, I think it's called Why Are the Kids Choosing to be Trans? Something like that. And I go into all the different underlying reasons and all the under, all the influences that could be uh, causing someone to believe that they're trans. Um a lot of this is philosophical so you know it depends on who you talk to uh, but what what i'll just say what i believe um that i believe it's coming from external sources there are people that have a very strong discomfort in their body and or a strong longing to be the opposite sex and that might not always come from like a tiktok video or reddit or something like that it might be coming from something else but Usually when you dig deeper, someone who feels that really strong discomfort in their body, there is something else going on. And most in most cases, when it's that pervasive, usually there's some kind of sexual trauma in their history that they've learned to hate their body or dissociate from their body or feel really uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, they're all different kind of scenarios of why someone might gravitate towards this and different influences. Um, but I do not believe that um, it's like a nature thing. I don't think someone is actually born in the wrong body, either adult or kids. Um, but what I can't argue, what I can't argue, is that I don't know if the choice of taking hormones and getting surgeries might be the right choice for a very select few amount of people. I can't argue that. So maybe that's true because I can't read everyone's minds. It's kind of what I say in the book. Um, but what I can say is that hormones and surgeries are extremely harmful to the body. So you make that choice and you know you're making a choice to harm your health. You're making a choice most likely to sterilize yourself. And um, you might be digging deep, uh, falling deeper into a hole aw away from the things that might help you feel comfortable in your body, uh, meaning like perhaps the sexual trauma, because um, doing that often is a way to escape, you know, you kind of shed a skin. So it's it's hard to say uh, if it's the right choice for everyone, but do I think that there's like an actual like gene or birth defect or something like that? Let's just say there's no proof of that. Okay. So that leads me to my next question. What do you see as the underlying moral decay contributing to um, not just trans identifying uh, individuals, but the suicide rates among children and adolescents, uh, even a really high amount of suicides after transition? Yeah, the whole suicide thing, that's their weapon, right? That's the thing they use to... I call it emotional blackmail to blackmail parents to go along with this uh, for people, for even legislatures that are thinking about laws around this. They're worried that they're going to induce suicide by preventing these uh, gender procedures. However, it's all a lie. And it's really what it is, is sort of a half truth about the suicide. And the reason for that is because the people that tend to gravitate towards the transgender world they have usually have underlying mental health issues that would lead them to be more suicidal so they have the data to show that yes trans people are more suicidal um, but we have no proof to show that affirming them is going to prevent that suicide so like you said there are suicides both you know before someone might transition and after or during or however you want to measure that so um there is a decay because we just keep talking about suicide and we keep almost glamorizing it, using it as a, a weapon. We're teaching all people, but mostly young people, that to get what they want, they can just say, I'm going to kill myself. And 
that's the way they're being taught that's how they should be accepted and loved is to just tell everybody they're going to kill themselves i mean that's the, that's the lesson because we're reinforcing that by saying oh okay we have to do this now so um yeah it's a huge decay and really if you like to get into the clinical terms of it this is these are the symptoms or traits of a person with a personality disorder and when someone has a personality disorder some, a lot of the treatment is to help them learn ways to ask for what they want and what they need without threatening suicide so that they can build stronger relationships you know that aren't about blackmail because of course someone in the moment is going to say okay i'll do what you need like i won't break up with you for example because i'm afraid my boyfriend's going to kill himself so i won't break up with him but that's not going to make a long-lasting relationship or true connection so um that's kind of what we're doing here with by keep using this suicide narrative is we're teaching them that this is the way they get what they want this is the way they they connect with the world and um, it's super unhealthy yeah and it's that to use your word it is creating a decay do you think um now we know that there's a high percentage of uh autism among the trans identifying population and I don't think it. I know that. Yes. <laughs> oh, right. Right. We know this. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, you know, it's kind of like what came first, the chicken or the egg, what came first, the, the trans identification or the suicidal tendencies. I wonder if a lot of that, the mental stress that leads somebody to conclude that ending their life might be some kind of solution might somehow be tied in with that lack of self-confidence uh, or a sense of identity, which leads them to start exploring these alternative routes to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I think it's all circular. I'm not sure which is the chicken or the egg, but um, I do believe if there weren't all the influences out there in the media and politics and commercials, um, just on the town where there are flags, you know, when you go to the coffee shop, if like all these things weren't in front of us all the time. I don't, I think someone who had, who felt a little lost, lonely, doesn't, is struggling to fit in or having, a, just having other struggles, th they might not land on the transgender identity. They might land on something else. They might just have other difficulties. But I think that there's this expansion of trans is because of all these external influences. If, what I see is that tr all these trans influences are preying on the vulnerable is how I see it. And the uh, autistic people are one of the biggest groups out there that are being preyed upon. They're being marketed to is what they are. They have their own flag. They have several flags. I actually, I made this little reference in my book. Uh, like uh, if anybody's seen the show, Big Bang Theory, Sheldon Cooper, that character who has autistic traits, he had a little TV show called Fun with Flags, you know, and it, it's, it's a joke. It's funny in the show, but I mean, that's what they're doing with the, the trans thing. You get a flag, you know, and autistic people like that because it's concrete and it, they feel like it, it represents them and it gives them a sense of belonging. Yeah. Yep. I know that reference. <laughs> I've seen uh, Young Sheldon too. That's a pretty great show. I, don't I actually like... didn't. I didn't get into that one. Yeah, oh. yeah. I I had some reservations about the character, but overall, it's a fabulous show. Um, but yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, the next question kind of answers itself because it has a lot to do with the fact that you wrote this book mm -hmm. and it's really about like, how do we empower parents and educators and mental health professionals to promote the traditional kind of common sense principles uh, upon which our identities are built? How do you? Yeah, I mean, that's mm -hmm. my entire mission is to empower parents because I think that insert that's one element of this is how I think how we've gotten to this place is that parents have um, deferred too much to experts and they don't believe in themselves the way they used to as parents. They think, well, I'm just a mom. I don't have degrees. I didn't study psychology or I didn't study medicine. So I, I'm going to listen to this doctor who has the white coat and the letters behind their names. So 
my goal is for you as a parent to believe in yourself. If something doesn't feel right, uh, to not ignore that feeling and to ask more questions, to question things. Because just because, like, just because the experts say doesn't mean it's good and it's true. Um, I don't think we need to dismiss literally every single thing an expert says. However, I do think we should never listen to experts blindly and we should very much believe in ourselves. And when someone, for example, says, would you rather have a dead daughter or a live son? And your daughter has never shown any signs of trans until they were on YouTube for several hours a day recently. And you know that this is because your child was influenced from the internet. Don't listen to that doctor, <laughs> you know, like think, think for yourself. And that's a lot of what this book is about. It is to empower parents, to give them the knowledge so that they can say exactly like counter a lot of these lies that are being told. And um, I kind of say some things that are, are like clinical. If you're talking to a therapist, like, why are you, you know, teaching my child things that are against what dialectical behavior, dialectical behavioral therapy teaches, which is, you know, to, um, you know, ask for help appropriately. Why are you telling, why are you talking about suicide in front of my child? We know that that's not you know, that goes against the guidelines for suicide prevention. Um, and, and really, and just the basic question, can you show me the data that you're quoting this from? Like, where are you getting this idea from? Like, it, they're basically just parroting it without um, understanding, or they've never read the studies, because all the studies that they quote are, they're false, they're, and they've been retracted. So ask them to literally show you this study so you can look at it and see that there may be like five participants or no control group. None of them have control groups. So all these things like push back, ask questions and um, have discernment. Wow. That was like the golden hammer for that, that whole you know, phraseology that gets pushed, you know, dead daughter, living son thing yeah, i have it's... a whole chapter on that so yeah yeah well good people need to go through this and uh discern the anecdotal from the real yeah there's two things there's one like the data is just false so it's a lie and then there's just the common sense of like this is just wrong like it's just wrong you don't talk about suicide to a kid in front of them and say that they're, they're going to kill themselves what do you have a magic ball or something how can anybody know someone's going to kill themselves even if we had this data which we don't you can't well, you would never do that like if you someone is at high risk of suicide you never sit there and be like well they're going to kill themselves you know like no don't that you don't do that that's just wrong and i would push back if i were a parent i mean um God, if any expert did that to me, oh, they get a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you then, what do you feel like or what do you think, based on your experience, uh, should the world look like? Should society kind of um, be like with regards to, okay, so there's gay people in the world, there's people who identify as trans we don't need flags up everywhere we go. We don't need propaganda reminding us of that. Um, how, what's, how could all of this fit into the delicate ecosystem of our culture? Well, I mean, I really wish I had a time machine. <laughs> and maybe if we could just take, you know, the DeLorean to back to, I'm not sure what year, maybe like 1994 or something, the way the world was then, I, that would be ideal for me. I liked it then when it comes to this gender stuff. Um, it wasn't every day. There were people who were gender, gender nonconforming. Uh, I'd say gays and lesbians were mostly accepted. Um, there wasn't gay marriage yet, but there, you know, there was, it was just a level of acceptance that was okay. Um, and it just wasn't on everyone's radar. There wasn't virtue signaling all the time. People were just living their lives. People were allowed to think for themselves. And things were certainly not pushed on children. So, I mean, those are the things I'd like to see. I don't know if that's the particular year. I mean, you could pick apart things, but um, it's just it's just things have gone crazy. I don't. I think even those of us who are observing it or you know can't unsee it. It's we still we have to be numb to it to a degree to get through our day. And it'd be nice to not have to do that. You know, to not have to. 
Oh gosh, now I'm get, I want to get coffee, and now I have to walk through this, tr you know, trans flag, <laughs> that, you know, on the door, and it's just like, really, <laughs> do I have to have this in front of my face? And when, like sometimes I'm with someone, I get irritated by it, and they're like, oh, just whatever, it's, Pam, let it go for now, and I'm like, ah, <laughs> like, I don't, I just want, I just wish I didn't have to, like when I'm just trying to go about my day that I didn't get like slapped in the face by it. And I'm an adult. I grew up when I didn't need, I didn't see all that stuff. So kids are seeing it all the time. So it'd be, yeah, it'd be nice if society could just let it go and stop trying to tell other people how to think and feel all the time. Yeah. What degree of this uh, growth and phenomena of this trans and uh, queer identifying youth uh, do you think is just pure social contagion? Yeah, I mean, I'd say most of it. I can't put a number, but no, I'd say almost all of it. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, if it's if it's constantly in their faces. Yeah, I have like in the book, I go into like all these different influences. And like I show the picture of when the White House had the trans flag up in the middle, you know, on Pride Month. And, you know, it was just in our faces constantly. Um, how could that not have an influence? I, I just, I just don't understand how, how anyone can think it's natural after, you know, this is the world we live in. Right. What do you think is the difference between gay people and the trans, uh, trans agenda, let's say, I mean, obviously we know the difference of sexual orientation versus I'm in the wrong body completely. Right. Um, but you know, we see in these two, like you were just saying, we've had the trans pride flag flown during gay pride month. You know, the progress flag, right? The progress flag. It's kind That's of like right. the communist flag, actually, in my opinion. But yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on there. They've inc they're including race on that now. You see the brown and black stripes. It's nothing to do with sexuality, nothing to do with being lost in space in the wrong body, right. and nothing to do with, you know, being attracted to the same sex. Now it's pretty much everybody but straight white male and female yeah um so what's the difference between that and gay the, i mean the biggest one is you don't need procedures to be gay right you don't need to be a lifelong medical patient and uh, provide lots of profit for big pharma to be gay so that's probably the biggest difference um i do this is probably not politically correct for your podcast but i I do think there are, especially kids that are wanting, they're opting to be gay or, or exploring their gayness when they might not otherwise, because they don't want to just be that normal, straight, hit, cis, whatever. And so the, they might choose to be gay for a while too. I'm not saying, I don't believe, I believe that, you know, some gay people, it's not a choice. That's my belief. But I, I do think that there are influences there too. So but either way, like, if you decide to be gay, you're not chopping off body parts, you're not uh, creating disabilities, you're not sterilizing anybody. You can decide that if it's true, you could just like a young person could decide that was a phase. I mean, I remember like, you know, in the 90s, like when I was going to college, like that was a phase for a lot of young women, like to explore, you know, am I lesbian or not? And then they decided they weren't, right? So, um, none of them lost their breasts through that exploration phase. None of them sterilized themselves through that. And then maybe some of them realized that they were lesbians and, you know, that's fine too. But that's, that's the big difference, right? When you're trying to figure yourself out, you're not making lifelong uh, damage to your body. Absolutely. I mean, even as, uh, as a gay person, don't tell anybody I told you this, Pamela, but I am a homosexual. Oh, um, no. Oh, I'll keep your secret. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I had a couple of experiences with a couple of ladies, we'll say, some so-called girlfriends, and that was completely sparred on by the peer pressure to assimilate toward a, you know, heteronormative society or to find myself as being straight. So if, you know, if myself in that situation can cause myself to try to experiment opposite to what I really was you know I think that says a lot about what you just said how it also can go the other way 
you can have very straight people looking around at this trend thinking maybe if i just try or maybe if i did this or that you know maybe there's some angle and it's unfortunate confusion there yeah and um and you're rewarded for it now which is weird you can't just be right like if you're a gay man that's cool you just are you know if i'm a straight woman i just am and that's cool but there's like social rewards now for doing for being certain identities especially for young people in their peer groups you know teenagers um you know you're boring and you know lame if you're just like a regular cishet especially if you're white i mean that's like a big sin right so um they're being they're being trained to hate themselves so of course they want to explore and choose to be something else yeah Yep, it's definitely not healthy. It's not at it's not natural. Not natural. So that, that's another thing to think about. Like, you know, what 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 are the messages your kids getting at school, uh, among their peers, and then also maybe from their teachers and the curriculums, um, social emotional learning. It's 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 teaching a lot of kids to hate themselves for simply how they were born. And so if you learn to hate yourself, then you might want to have another identity. You might want to change your name and your look and then get a bunch of flags in a parade and perhaps even an assembly and told that you're stunning and brave. Uh, that makes sense. And you just made an interesting point because not only are people being shamed into hating who they are, but they're also being rewarded for changing that identity. Exactly. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And I mean, that's mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all over Hollywood is everywhere. Like there, I believe there's a lot of people that wouldn't be seen the time of day if they were just a regular straight person, <laughs> even if they were really talented. And yeah. People are, yeah. There are other people are getting the recognition just for their identities. I mean, it's like the woke Olympics in Hollywood now. Exactly. It's like uh, some kind of, uh, so, what was I going to say, social uh, engineering. For sure. Um, full on right now. Um, all right. So we've got a little bit of time left. So I'm going to just ask you a couple more questions. Okay. And anything you want to originate, please do. Um, what are the potential consequences of deviating from traditional gender norms and promoting uh, gender nonconformity in young people. I mean, yeah, of course, we're looking at it. We're looking at suicide. We're looking at depression and mental illness and regret. What does it look like in 20, 40 years from now, this generation? Yeah, it looks bad. <laughs> There's my answer. <laughs> I mean, you, get, you can get really dark with it. Um, yeah. we're we're talking about sterilizing a generation and not being able to uh, build families, you know, destroying the family. We're destroying families. They're severing kids from their current parents, and then we're we're also making it more difficult for them to build future families. The trans people would say, "Oh, it's fine. We can just do, you know." IVF or you know freeze eggs or you know make it's all simple right like just whatever you know <laughs> just do it um, of course that's more money for the um, fertility business but it's it it's not the same it's not the same kind of connections when you're dealing with uh, kids adoptive kids um, families I'm not saying that that that's wrong or bad but we people do need legacies if all the families are severed or I'll say a large portion of them for, as a result of this, that, that certainly has a negative impact on society. Um, the, other, the other piece is that's really dark is the idea of, of this really being a form of transhumanism. You know, the, the push for people to be more online, to be an avatar, this meta universe that, um, you know, Zuckerberg is building to just have everybody be online and your body is kind of a vessel and inconsequential and you can just chop it up and do whatever you want to it you know at a whim and then call that like you know part of your identity is it like we're all sort of playing god here like this 
changing our body. I mean, you, you, people make these arguments about plastic surgery and there is a huge parallel and yeah, you know, what, where is the line for that too? The difference is, is plastic surgery is not looked at as life-saving healthcare. So, um, I see them as very similar. I, I see the problems on both things. So yeah, we're, we're really dissociating people from their bodies. Like you are your body, whether you like it or not. <laughs> And um, I think that's a really unhealthy message to give to young people. And so that that's scary for society. I mean, basically, it's, yeah, it's it's like every dystopian novel you can think of, like Brave New World meets 1984 <laughs> meets uh, Divergent meets, I don't know, like all these, you know, The Hunger Games. Like, it's like, we don't want to live in dystopia. If And if this keeps going, that's we're kind of in it already, but I think we are, we can fight it if, if, but if we keep going in this direction, it's going to be scary in my opinion. Yeah, it, it, it is going to be scary. It is getting scary. We are in dystopian territory already. Yeah. I completely agree. There is a commonality between the trans gender issue and the trans human issue. I think in either case, we've, uh, objectified the body and you know some might say even like well we could say we are our body or we could even say we have a body but in either case it's a reflection of something much deeper and I think you know when it comes to issues around uh, philosophy you know even spirituality we talk about how if a child is going through a trans identifying crisis, then they can grow out of it. They can mature out of it, mm -hmm. you know? So with psychological development, with the knowledge of who you are comes an acceptance uh, or an appreciation for what you are, you know, what you've come into the world as. And when we take away that, and we make it uh, make a society that's just based on like likes and social media yeah. uh, appraisal. Then all of a sudden, it's what's good enough is what society praises. Where you're getting your likes and your feedback yeah, from the external instead of coming from inside, right? It's such an empty existence. So I mean, we're seeing this already with social media, but I, this empty, this vast emptiness in our culture is is becoming more and more pervasive. And I think this trans thing is, is just one way it's manifesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with regards to that, um, online community, social media platforms, they are uh, influencing the moral compass of young people. So how do we counteract that? Is do Do we have a machine big enough to fight that influence machine i think so you guys are a big part of that gaze against groomers you guys are awesome um because of course the trans community uses gay people as a shield and say you're and they lump you all together and say you're anti-lgbtq plus plus um and you guys are like uh, -uh we ain't playing that game <laughs> <laughs> and that that was a huge huge dagger in their little plan um, so that just shows right there that yes, we have the strength. We just have to do it, come together and speak up. Um, but then even just in our own homes, I think it, it you, we can make a difference because the way, especially young people get recruited is when they're more isolated and they don't feel like they belong. And so if you have a strong family and you, um, are present with your children and you are, um, able to show love and, you know, get your kid to be participate in life in, in a positive way that that right there is a great way to inoculate them from getting sucked into this. And just just being truthful too, not always kind of going along just to be nice. Yeah, we need parents who are going to tell us what's really going on, not what we want to hear. If they're going to yeah. be, I mean, Growing up, you know, you think, why are they like spanking me or disciplining me? Okay. Obviously, kids of this current generation are not going to understand what I'm talking about. But believe it or not, there was a time when when you did bad, 
there was a consequence you and got then punished. you got we got we called the punishment and then what would happen is it would create this change in your trajectory. You'd say, oh, I don't want to do that action anymore. Make better choices. Yeah, I'm going to make different <laughs> choices, better choices. And and sometimes the only reinforcement of that, you know, change of trajectory is somebody's going to be mad at home. But the bigger lesson is if you try that out in the real world, you're going to have really bad consequences. That's why we're creating consequences at home yeah and so, and so we don't have that anymore so we you know as i got older you know i'm like oh you know it probably would have been better if i would have been disciplined more like i see you know my peers who maybe had a very disciplined upbringing who are very you know upright and you know productive and this that and the other and then i'm thinking you know is it just their personality is it their their stars or you know the nature or was it the nurture question yeah, you know that's a big point i mean probably both it's hard to say but yeah. yeah there's certainly there's certainly an element to that um yeah and then also i don't think parents realize this you know the i'd say the more progressive ones that are, are more permissive that um when you provide structure for your kids you, that is a way of showing love to them when you're punishing them and you're not just being their friend. The, the kids actually know that, that you love them. And maybe not in the moment they might be yelling at you and say, I hate you, mom, or whatever. But but really in the end, they know that you that you care and that you love them because if you didn't care, you'd let them then it means you're letting them do whatever they want. And that that to, to many kids feels like apathy. So I I know a lot of kids kind of act out because they're looking for someone to provide that structure for them because I've worked with a lot of kids with severe behavioral issues and um, they would I would see that in their behaviors and then some of them would actually tell me that that they were you know that they appreciate when rule, there are rules because that means that someone's looking out for them so I think I think that message gets lost in this permissive parenting uh, culture you know, I was just watching uh, a movie. I went and saw Dune two yesterday, oh, but in order to, in order to watch that, I had to watch Dune one. So I couldn't spouse... even. It was so long. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, my spouse wanted to watch it, so I was like, "Okay, let me get caught up in the first one." Even though I don't really, I'm not really into like dusty, you know, movies and stuff like that. Um, but one Those of the characters ships char landing <laughs> ships <goes> forever <laughs> it could be it could be fun but again too dusty too you know grungy for me um and there was a character who i believe i believe that's where i was watching it in the first part who was like i'm gonna take this other person on as my assistant because they tell me and maybe it wasn't that they tell me how how it is you yeah. know they don't just say what i want to hear and so when, you know, you get older and you get into a position of responsibility and then you need to depend on other people to help keep you in check because you can't do it all on your own, you appreciate correction with love. You appreciate people telling you the hard truths. We don't like that as a kid because we don't see any need for that. But when we get older, it's different. And so now the kids don't have that uh, growing up and we grow up like wild animals. And, you know, what they say about teaching an old dog new tricks, you can't do it. And so it's harder at least. Yeah, it, exactly. It can be done. It's just harder. And so they're running amok and they're giving the society, the world, the middle finger. And as far as they're concerned, you know, they can do no wrong. Like I know this one. And uh, while they're suffering through it. That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're having fun. They feel like they don't feel good doing being in this chaos that has been created. So anyway, sorry to interrupt. No, right. They're lost. Yeah. So there's this one individual I know, and she's got a son. And I was like, let me talk to this person uh, without going into too many details about my life. And she said, well, so-and-so, we'll call him Johnny, is playing right now and doesn't want to talk. Now, I'm the uncle of this person, so okay. naturally I'm thinking, huh? What do you mean they're right. playing? You're the parent. Tell them to talk yeah. on the phone. You're the grown-up. Yeah. You know, and so, and this is a very young mother, okay? And so it's just, I'm kind of seeing this progression of like, 
the kids do what they want to do. You don't put any rules on them. And then the next generation comes in and says, I don't want there to be any rules of my kid, anything they want. And it's just going to keep going in that direction where you don't do the things that you ought to do because they weren't enforced on you because it was, you know, your parent considered it a mark of their freedom to be unencumbered by other people's expectations or anything like that. So I didn't mean to go down that rabbit hole, but just to say that if we don't parent the kids and we let the kids parent us, disaster ahead. Yeah. I mean, what, what like really good athlete wants a coach that just says you're doing great all the time. You, they want a coach that's going to tell them do better and be hard on them so they can improve. Anybody who really wants to be a better, stronger athlete wants a tough coach, right? I used to do martial arts and I loved my, you know, my senseis because they would, you know, be tough on me. I love that. And, um, you know, there's a balance because there's times where things are hard and people need a little more of a softer approach. But at the same time, we, I feel like we've just swung so far in one direction. Yeah. No, we have, and it's made the necessity for, uh, your book, which yeah. is crazy that we're, you know, down this rabbit hole, but it, it is a real reality. And it's the, yeah. uh, pra the practical response to gender distress. Yeah. I was going to say in that light, like at the end, um, I have a whole chapter on like how to talk to your trans identified teen. And it's, it's kind of has like a balanced way of, it has ideas because of course I can't write a script for you and your kid because I don't know you guys. But what I do is I give you ideas of things you could ask that are open-ended questions that aren't super confrontational because people on one other side of the spectrum are really confrontational and just start kind of yelling at the kid and saying, you know, you're, you know, there's only two genders and you know, that, that kind of doesn't help once the kids are already indoctrinated by the trans people. Um, but then also not just going along with it either. So they're like, I kind of talk, give tips so you can be a little more middle ground and to, to really figure out which side or of the pendulum to lean on that I, I can't really say, but it's, it's really more of a trial and error thing. And you're not probably not going to say the right thing, but these are just things to try. Um, one, one example of a question is like, what does it mean to be trans for you? you know, to ask the kid, just like generally being curious rather than be like, you're not trans, stop it. Right. Be like, well, what does that mean to you? And have them and see what they say. And uh, most likely they won't have a real answer because it's so vague and th they probably hadn't really thought about it. They just are kind of going along with it. And a lot of the questions might be a hard, upsetting because you're all, you're kind of poking holes in their ide ideas uh, but hopefully cumulatively it might it might help them get back to reality so that so that's sort of the goal and those are some of the tips that i have in there that's amazing that is a really important uh part of your book because communicating is the biggest problem that people are facing you know parents don't know what their kids have been told all day and they also don't know the right answer because so many landmines have been set up in the minds of these kids to say, they're going to say this and that's, that. yeah, that's transphobic right there. And so it really, it really is a trial and error game with uh, whoever you're talking to, to see how far developed they are, how well they understand their own situation, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. well, Pamela Garfield Yeager, we had such an amazing talk with you today. And I thank you thank so you. much for your time. Um, would you, for our uh, viewers and listeners, again, share your web address, your book title, all that? Okay. I got the book here sitting next to me, so I'll do this. A Practical Response to Gender Distress. It's pink and blue. I have a picture of this, like, kind of warped family on the trans flag. That's what that the meaning of that is. So, cause, because, as we said earlier in our conversation, this is about destroying families, and my goal is to strengthen families. So that's what, that's what's um, that. I have a website called thetruthfultherapist.org and you could actually book a one-on-one -on -one consultation with me via Zoom if you have questions, uh, need help maybe figuring out if mental health uh, like therapy in your family could be helpful or um, 
really a lot of what I do is empower parents. Like, I don't tell you what to do. I really want you to believe in yourself. So that's a lot of it. I kind of hear what's going on in your family and just ask some basic questions of, so that you kind of know where to go from there. Um, I have an Instagram, which is the dot truthful therapist. My Twitter is a truth therapist. I couldn't do the because it doesn't fit in Twitter. Um, I have a sub stack, which is Pam, the truthful therapist. So the truthful therapist is the theme here. I'm a truthful therapist, and that's a lot of what my handles are. So if you Google my name, a truthful therapist, you'll find stuff, uh, information from me. Great. Yes, you are well known as a truthful, uh, truthful therapist. And um, other question, or actually other statement, I hear this book's doing pretty good on Amazon. Where does yeah. it sit right now? Well, I mean, they have these categories and it's fun to watch like how they rank. And um, right now I'm in number one in the teen LGBTQ plus books category. Um, and it's really fun because mine's on the top and then below it are all the kind of disgusting, really sexually explicit books that like Moms for Liberty and you guys have been pushing back against. Um, so it's kind of fun to see mine sitting on top of these like icky ones. Like there's one called All Boys Aren't Blue, which is really ha sounds innocent kind of, but it's not inside. This book is gay. Anyway, mine's on top of those on that list. So that's fun. Um, and then, yeah, it's it's also like, num it, you know, these things. I don't know how they calculate it because it keeps changing. But the, there's a there's the general LGBTQ plus and demographic issues books. And it's been sitting at like between like six and 10 and it keeps moving around. So that's fun to watch. Um, yeah. So I appreciate the support and hopefully more people buy it um, and more people will read it than like just word, it'll get word of mouth. Uh, it'll sell itself that way. So yeah, it's, it's pretty easy read. It's not very, uh, it's not weighed down by a lot of, um, like history and theory and I don't even use a lot of clinical language it's really for someone who just really just wants the facts and wants like what to do practically and then at the very end it has a ton of resources so pretty much every website other books uh, like tons of other films you guys gaze against groomers are listed in the resources um, I have pictures and graphics I, I even used I think I assume Jamie did it from Gaze Against Groomers, like her graphics save the tomboys for mm -hmm. you guys, you know, so it's got like pictures in addition to words to, to really get, get the message across and for people to understand what's going on and how to fight it. Excellent. That's amazing. Well, I hope everybody uh, checks out uh, Pamela Garfield Yeager's book, A Practical Response to Gender Dis uh, Distress, Tips and Tools for Families, and uh, follow us on Spotify, iHeartRadio, iTunes, uh, Podbean, wherever podcasts are had. And it was great talking to you, Pamela. Thank you so much. Let's do it again sometime. Appreciate it. Yes. All right. Thank you.